I want to thank the Green Team for asking me to uh, speak today. I appreciate it very much as I realized that I didn't know it at the time, but I took a active part in the very first and the largest Earth Day celebration in Philadelphia on April 22, 1970. I'm actually wearing a cross that I didn't have then, but actually is very symbolic of that period. The cross that I'm wearing today is from the 1970s of that era. I also want to thank the Green Team for their very hard work and careful thought in preparing the service today. Today, the lesson comes from the book of Nehemiah. You are the Lord, and you alone. You have made heaven the heaven of heavens with all the hosts, the earth, and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them, and as you preserve all of them, and the hosts of heavens worship you. Reading from the, verse, the book of Isaiah from the 11th chapter, Verses 6 through 9. The wolf shall lie down with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fatted calf together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, and the young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put its hand in the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy. In all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord. As the waters covers the sea, thus endeth the lesson. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts on the scripture be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and redeemer. No, you can't put that table there. A commanding voice stopped me as I and another young student were about to place a card table in front of the bank building on Market Street in Philadelphia. We showed our credentials to this somewhat officious person and compromised by moving the table away down the street near the corner where we could place on it our leaflets and flyers. It was Earth Day week and the big festival of Earth Day itself of April 22nd. On this somewhat windy mid-April day, my friend Danny and I began to hand out flyers. So began my modest part in environmental activism. The year was 1970, and it was the first ever Earth Day week. An ad hoc committee of students, professionals, intellectual, blue-haired ladies from garden clubs of Philadelphia's main line, that is the posh suburbs of Philly, politicians, professionals, and clergy all were anxious to participate in a movement started by Senator Gaylord Nelson, a U.S. Senator from Wisconsin. He had witnessed the ravages of the 1969 massive oil spill in Santa Barbara and was inspired by student anti-war movement and realized he could use this youthful energy with emergent public consciousness about air and water pollution. It would force environmental protection onto the national political agenda. Senator Nelson announced the idea for a national teach-in on the environment and proclaimed it to the national media. A few years earlier, Rachel Carson's New York Times best-selling book, Silent Spring, represented a watershed movement for the modern environmental cause. 
Selling more than half a million copies, it had raised public awareness and concern for all living things, the environment, and public health. The largest of the first U.S. Earth Day celebration was centered in Philadelphia, and I was in the midst of my three years there as a graduate student at the University of Pennsylvania. There at Penn, I was part of a circle of ragtag friends, some students, some just working, some even still in high school, and 10 of us would hang out together quite often. I learned of the Earth Week plan through the campus news, and we all wanted to take part and join in. Our acknowledged leader was Doug, a shaggy-haired blonde kid who had recently started a band. His band was to produce several albums, and he even named his band something ecologically correct. The band's name was Forest Green. For Earth Week, I had signed up with another kid to help man one of the information tables that I just described. On Earth Day, we walked in a huge parade of 40 to 60,000 people marched to Fairmont Park, the beautiful park in Philadelphia, on rolling sloping hills, and we walked on car freeze highways. We picnicked together on the sloping greens and listened to urban planner Ian McCaig, poet Allen Ginsberg, and Senator Edmund Muskie, who was author of the 1970 Clean Air Act, who gave the keynote address. It was a memorable day and exciting to be part of the first national event of America going green. But what was the root cause of this action, needed action? What fouled our nest, and where did it all begin? I think we need to go back to Genesis. Let us take a look at the imaginary peak at a conversation in the original Garden of Eden. Do you remember the part where Eve offers Adam the forbidden fruit? Eve showed Adam a very red apple. Eve said, you want to try it? Adam replied, what is it? Looks pretty red to me. So maybe a Granny Smith would be better? Yeah, I think that would be. Eve said, try it. I bet it must taste good. It looks so red, at least it should be. I thought this tree was off limits and not supposed to be eaten. Are you sure about this? Eve replied, aren't rules made to be broken anyways? And Mr. Snake said it was yummy. Looks pretty artificial to me. And would you take the word of a snake? Besides, we were just told no. Yeah, but read the label. It sounds okay, don't you think? Well, let's see. Let's look at this label. It says, satisfaction guaranteed. There's no expiration date. Can it be really good then? Not to be eaten by anyone under the age of 18. Hey, what's that all about? And this product says not sold in stores. Caution, it says ingestion of this product may cause theological confusion if eaten in quantity. I'm beginning to have my doubts about this. Eve uh, and look, it also said, sinfully delicious. Eve said, but Adam, look how tempting it looks. Do try it. Adam, well, maybe I'll take just one little bite. Well, unfortunately, we all knew what happened. And s Adam took his bite. So did Eve. The snake slivered away, and Adam tossed the wrapper on the ground. Shame on him. And so began our wayward path of not being green. Just what happened? Look what happened. Mankind disobeyed the instructions of a creator. He put faith in an ecologically unsound product and started littering in the garden from day one. Looking at the Bible, we again and again see references to the good farmer, the good shepherd, the careful tiller of the soil, and the thrifty steward of the vineyard. God calls us not to be wasteful. We should be good farmers of God's green earth. 
Years ago, as a young teen, here in this sanctuary, I carefully listened to the sermon of an interim pastor of this church. The Reverend Barber was a very wise and thoughtful old Yankee preacher, and he gave a sermon called, We Are God's Farms. His analogy was a good one. For our lives are like that of farms. Some of us are either prosperous farmers or poor ones. Some of our farms are barren, and some of us practice good husbandry, that is, the fine art of agriculture, while others do not. I am not talking about actually having a green thumb, nor about, um, about amassing wealth in a monetary sense, but in a spiritual sense. Some Christian lives bloom, but others fail, and it seems to be as if the seeds of God's words were planted on a barren and rocky soil. In his sermon, Reverend Bar Barber told of one old Yankee farmer that each spring his land was so barren that he had to file down the noses of his sheep so that they could get between the crevices of the rocks in the fields to get the new grades of black grass to feed upon. We need to be innovative in a way like the farmer. Not that I'm advocating filing the noses of sheep to fit between the rocks, but find other ways. Thinking outside the box, it is always a good plan. Our ancestors knew a thing or two. When they faced rocks in their lands here in New England, they made stone walls from them. When they had a huge crop of granite in Maine jutting out from the ledges, they cut it up into small blocks and sold it to Boston for street paving. When winters were harsh and cold, they took ice from the lakes and ponds and shipped it south for refrigerators before we had invented electrical refrigerators. And to keep it from melting on the way, they packed it in the sailing ships as far away as Kankata with sawdust, a waste product. And now it had a good use in the ice house, in these ice houses all of over New England. They were being green. Being green is not more is not just is much more than just changing a light bulb from one kind to another. It is about transforming our hearts and minds to see God's creation in a new way that leads to living a new life in your community. To be green outside, we must develop a way of thinking to be green inside. It is gaining a life and a community spirit based on relationships and caring for God's creation. It works at the individual, community, and global level. As a people of faith, we look to the scriptures for guidance in the choices we make in our lives. God saw in his creation in Genesis that everything was very good. We learn later that as God had given us people as a people free will, we have the freedom to make moral choices and that each of, each of our lives have with it the responsibility for our personal actions or inactions. With the freedom of God's gift, we have choices. The prophet Micah guided us towards moral and res a responsible lifestyle. Choices, he said, we are to do justice, love kindness and mercy, and wa walk humbly with our God. It is like the partnership of the steward and the master tending a farm together. We understand scripture compels us to act on our faith grounded in wonder, reverence, love, and respect for all of God's creation. But some of our choices have resulted in vanished and degraded farmlands, air unfit to breathe and water unfit to drink, unsustainable energy processes and consumption, and perilous, immediate, long-term, worldwide consequences of global warming and climate change. And now we realize more every day that our choices threaten the voiceless natural system that sustains all life here on Earth 
itself. When we confront the environmental responsibility, people of faith now face an additional choice, either to live in despair or with hope. We in the United Church of Christ are called to live with hope. We are called to beyond, go beyond lifestyle adjustments. We are called to spiritual and lifestyle transformations based on justice and reverence for all of God's creatures and creation. We are called by Jesus to love God and love our neighbor as ourselves. With God's grace, we invite individuals to transform their lives in their communities to become better. In the 1960s, an early thinker of these themes of conservation wrote a Christian education program called Partners with the Creator. This was the Reverend Franklin Cooker, who was for a while director of the Rolling Ridge Conference Center nearby in North Andover. His focus was that we were created to be in partnership with our creator. And if we are meant to be in partnership, then as a responsibility to care for creation, to care for the earth. It seems most fitting that, East, that Earth Sunday falls here at Easter time, a time of rebirth and renewal. Though it is quite a few years ago, I remember how beautiful spring can be in eastern Pennsylvania. Do go there sometime, sometime in the spring, if ever you can. Its lushness of green in the spring time, colors of young plants and flowers are breathtakingly beautiful. I would like to leave you with a word picture. In Bucks County, Pennsylvania, there was a Quaker preacher who was also a noted painter. His name was Edward Hicks, who worked in the 1840s. The theme of his many paintings were drawn from chapter 11 of Isaiah. And in his words, he wrote, the wolf shall also dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. He created many versions of this beautiful painter, painting, but also had in it the lion, the lamb, and the child in perfect harmony. So my advice for you today is to take this image of tranquility and harmony with you as you carry the banner of being green. It is a symbol of all, hum all of humanity at harmony with nature. <clears throat> Take Reverend Barber advice, and as Christ le has led us, be a bountiful farmer yourself. I do hope that your own inner farm may prosper and not be a barren one, but productive, lush vegetation and beautiful blooms that will never fade away. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, help us to love thy land and respect this earth. Let us be good stewards of the environment and care for this planet, which sustain us in all of our lives. For we, like every creature of this marvelous realm of your creation, need an unpolluted and green environment in order to flourish and live. Let us indeed work to create a new Jerusalem, the city on the hill, where the lion may lie down with the lamb, and that following Christ's teaching, we can work at last to bring your kingdom here. Amen.